Uh, just give me five, perhaps five minutes if you have any questions about this, short. Uh, otherwise, we can, uh, we can talk uh, offline. Uh, this one there. OK, so uh, eh, um, is the main ad uh, advantage of this approach to have um, smoother um, space to integrate in time? Mm -hmm. so, that's, uh, okay. so that's the main, I mean, the, uh, all of this is, was OK, so let me put it this way. So you could do this without all this, um, um, all this uh, uh, regularization or consistency losses. Uh, the point is like you may get something that is very uh, rough. And where it's rough is very hard to, well, it's not hard, but it, it will, you need to like take much more time steps. So basically everything that you say from having a smaller dimensional uh, space, you spend it because you have to uh, do it much more sampling in, uh, in time. So in some way you project on a flat uh, space to integrate with uh, fewer time steps? Uh. Uh, I mean, it's not a projection. Uh, I mean, well, it's, it's a nonlinear projection. Basically you have a manifold uh, yeah. and you integrated that manifold. Okay. Did that answer your question? Yeah, yeah. Perfect. You. Okay. So. Uh, for the sake of time, uh, let's move on to the next topic. So as I mentioned before, uh, anyway, it doesn't work. There it is. So what I mentioned before is like this kind of three uh, parts. So uh, let me just, before we start and see if you're awake, let's do a, a quick poll. So can you raise your hands if you have a, uh, let's see, what is the most likely, an applied math background? How many? Okay, uh, physics background. Okay, a few CS background. Few. Uh, okay, so I, I just want to see: Are you well? Uh, any other background that? Is <laughs> no. I mean, I don't know. I mean, uh, I met a few people that were uh, was pretty surprised. It was like a psychology and uh, an art that were like uh, on Facebook doing uh, software engineering. Anyway, uh, so uh, I assume that you will be confident with uh, SDs or stochastic differential equations. Uh, or if if not, I will. Just think about this an, uh, as an ODE that you add some noise. Uh, that will be kind of this description. So uh, this part I will try to go a little bit slower because uh, I'm fairly new to this as well. And I haven't written a blackboard for like two, two years. So I hope that my handwriting is going to be good. Uh, so let's go very slowly. And let's start with what we want to do to uh, these uh, lectures. So in this case, we want to really go to this, the third topic that we had. Uh, you recall that classification. Uh, regression <laughs> gener uh, generation, and some of the, you told me, like, actually, there's one missing that is uh, reinforced learning, that that will be basically control, co how to learn a control. So, in this case, we'll do uh, generation. So, what is generation? I mean, uh, the most uh, basic mathematical framework that you use for generation is just uh, sampling. So, you have a probability distribution P, or something that is, or, uh, um, uh, that is proportional to P. And then you will be able to basically sample from that distribution. That is kind of the simplest way of, 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 of phrasing this problem. Now, the issue is that you don't know P, uh, you only have samples. So you basically, from samples, you want to get other samples and they're very high dimensional space. So we'll try to do that. So instead of just uh, going forward with the future models right away, I will try to uh, slowly introduce you to the classical uh, uh, sampling techniques. So we'll start with these three uh, left. Uh, MCMC are not here. I think that this was a little bit too complicated to, to introduce in a lecture. Uh, if you know, great. If you don't, uh, it's fine. So let's start with the, just the classical things. So inverse transfer sampler, this basically you learn almost in kindergarten. Reaction samplers, uh, Langevin dynamics. And you have a few different uh, sampling methods for machine learning. Uh, in this case, we will try, I will argue that diffusion models is kind of the uh, the spiritual descendant of Langevin dynamics. You will see in a moment why. Uh, so another, I will only cover diffusion models, a very simply uh, version of that. Uh, now, and this you know already. So uh, this is basically what MATLAB will do if you ask for like any, uh, any weird, uh, uh, well, anything that is not uni uniform, it will do the inverse transform uh, sampler. So what you do here is you, uh, you go from the fact that if you have, uh, let's say, a random variable x with a distribution, uh, uh, well, a probability distribution p of x, and uh, CDF f, that is, of course, just the interval between the minus infinity to x of p of, uh, okay, bad, bad notation, p of y dy. 
uh, then you have this small theorem that tells you like uh, uh, f, capital F of x, this, uh, the transformation of the random variable x by its own uh, CDF actually follows a uniform between 0 and 1. Uh, well, of course, there are a few assumptions here. P of x has to be always positive, so f is actually not a This is not, you don't need anything here. You need something for the next one. So, uh, what is the advantage of this is that we will see all these sampling methods uh, under the light of a start from something that you can sample easily. In this case, it will be a uniform uh, distribution, and then transform that sample such that the transform version actually follows what you want. So in this case, it's going to be exactly that. So what you can do is uh, just uh, uh, generate samples, uh, psi, from the uniform between 0 and 1. And you will do this, transform this psi, following basically the inverse of this uh, CFD of psi. Uh, and then it actually, this is going to follow P of x. Uh, is this clear? I mean, I think that we see, I mean, I recall that we s normally we see that in undergrad. It's kind of the first uh, probability course. If it's not, uh, let, me, uh, let me know. So let's do like a, a, fairly, sim a fairly simple uh, uh, diagram for this. So what you will do, you will you, let's say you sample all this i here, right? And then these are uniform as you can see. And then you can see from each of those, you go left and you see which is the point they generate. So basically you compute the inverse of these guys and then you project back. Uh, so what is happening here is like as you can see, um, this is a Gaussian. This is the CA, uh, CDF of the Gaussian. And you can see that where uh, the, this is the highest gradient. So basically, you have a bigger, uh, when the Gaussian itself is, 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 is higher, you will see that there are uh, more and more samples around that area. So basically, this is proportional to uh, the height of, the, of P of x in this case. OK. This is, is this clear. So again, transform from uh, something that is uniform to, in this case, a Gaussian. It is clear, clear now. I mean, it's going to get very, uh, it's, it's going to go ramp up in, uh, in difficulty. So I just want to be sure that the, the most basic is clear. Yes, no? OK, thanks. It's very nice when you have feedback from the audience. Um, OK, next step. Uh, so the issue with like the, uh, what I just presented you, you can, do all, uh, can only do in 1D. And as you can see, you need uh, F, you need P. So you really need the expression of P, and you need uh, F, and then you need a way to invert S. Uh, which is not always the case. Although you can claim that you can do something that is called quantile mapping, that basically approximate this by, um, by just the histogram. Uh, you can do that as well. But in general, you need P and F. OK, so the problem is that many times you don't really have P. You have something that's proportional to P. So in this case, we'll call little f uh, this guy there. And what is the advantage of this is that uh, there's a way to do this sampling uh, using what's called reaction sampling. So what is the main idea? It's basically, imagine you have f, that's something uh, proportional to p, or just for this case, just suppose that it's p. So what you want to do is you're going to embed this guy in, like, in, a, in a box, like in a canvas, if you can think, and you're going to start to throw in dart. So all these uh, crosses x is our just think our uh, uh, dart that are done basically uniformly in this box. And then you're going to say, well, all the darts that are uh, in the, in below the graph of f of x are going to be your samples. So uh, let me draw here. So this is, uh, OK, let me see how we do this. Oh, let's start here. So what you're doing is basically you have uh, your box. Uh, let's call it, uh, this is x. This can be, let's call it y. And then you have your distribution here. Let's suppose that is uh, compactly supported. Uh, you have f of x. And then you're going to do start to basically throw a dart. OK, let's throw a lot of them. So then you will say, OK, so about all of these darts, which are the ones that are inside, like below this f? It's going to be all of the guys here, right? And what you say, well, I mean, let's take this one, project it back, this back, this one, this one, and so on. So your samples are going to be these guys uh, in the x axis. Now, why this actually is give you a correct uh, uh, sample, samples? Because as the highest uh, f is, 
if you take a little like uh, a very thin uh, a, a portion, more the more likely are you going to have samples that go here, so you will have more samples down here. And it turns out this is basically uh, proportional to the height of f. So if you do this, basically you will have samples that follow f, even though you're only sampling from a uniform distribution. So this is another uh, way of ba basically, you have a uniform distribution, who will get sample from f or p in this case. And as you can see, this f, you can move it, uh, 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 you can move this up and down, and the ratio is going to be, uh, is going to remain the same. So you don't need f to be exactly equal to p, it can be something that's proportional uh, to p. Is that clear? Yes, no? Okay, so there's another other way to do this. I mean, perhaps you don't want to do this in a box uh, all the time, so you can do something that's slightly smarter. So you take this guy, you have uh, the same F, uh, well, well, it's not the same, but uh, similar F here. And you want to say, it's like, well, I want to sample uniformly between uh, zero and one. Let's call super that is zero, and this is one. So I get this point here. And then you will say, okay, now we're going to sample uniformly between uh, this point and this point. Let's suppose again, for simplicity, zero and one, okay? So you will do like a, a, random, uh, a random sample. Let's call it u. And then I will accept that sample if u is less than f of x, f is your sample here, otherwise I will reject it. So this is exactly the same as before. The difference here, instead of throwing dart everywhere, you throw one dart in here, you throw one another dart in this direction, and then you try to see if you're here, uh, you will accept, otherwise you will, uh, you will react. And of course, it's you're more likely to accept when you have something that is uh, f is larger than when f is uh, smaller. You can show in this case, you will generate samples basically very concentrated in places like that and very uh, sparse in, in places like that. I mean, we can do the same as a Gaussian, a Gaussian uh, I mean, or something that looks like a Gaussian is gonna be perhaps a little bit easier. You have something like this. So you sample something uniform, for example, here. And in this case, basically, you will always uh, accept. But if you uh, sample here and then you go into this direction, this is much less likely because you have only a small uh, uh, chance to be accepted. Questions? No? Is this clear over so many? Yes? No? Okay. So uh, now the question becomes like, well, I mean, we have. Uh, we have this uniform thing, but I mean, this is a little, uh, first, if, if you have something that is, uh, is not uh, properly supported, you, can, you, know, you cannot use this uh, very efficiently, and then you're kind of losing a lot of, uh, a lot of space here, nonetheless. There's a lot of samples that are going to be, uh, not going to be, going to be re rejected. So can you do something a little bit better? If you know something about F, let's say G, can you do something a little bit better? So uh, the point is that yes, so this is the, uh, the second um, idea that you have here, is that, again, let's do a little bit bigger here. You will have uh, G that is your proposal distribution. So uh, G proposal distribution. And then you will have F around here, let's say like this. And what you're going to do, you're going to sample from G. So basically, in this case, you will sample uh, on X following G. So as you can see, it's more likely that you can sample from this part than, for example, in the middle, and more likely to sample from here. And then you're going to do play the same game. The main issue here is that uh, how do you compare these two? So the point that people will do is basically they will have this extra M, that M is such a way that it's always bounds f by above. So let's call it this g. Okay, this is not, they don't look very way, uh, alike, but uh, they should be. This is m of g of x, and this is f of x. So you're going to do exactly the same game. Uh, you will sample g here, then you will uh, sample a uniform uh, u from this point to m of g of x, and then you will, uh, you will accept if you lie 
uh, below f, and you're going to reject. So this is good, this is bad. And you're going to do this for uh, many of these points. So okay, it's going to be a lot of colors here. Uh, so you could do, for example, uh, here too. You run, and uh, this is going to be bad. From here to here is going to be good. So you can do this uh, many, many times. And this, uh, well, you can prove uh, that under a few uh, assumptions, this is going to be, uh, this is going to give you the correct uh, uh, F, samples from the correct F. Now, the point here is that the issue is like, uh, what is this M is needed for? And how this uh, number of rejections uh, um, uh, are basically related to this M. So, we can do a small computation for that. So, okay, let me just write it this properly. So, what do you have? Uh, okay, let me see if I can this, how this M is important. So, what you want is basically be able to uh, accept as many samples as you want. Why? Because every, everything that is in, in this space, let's say in this space, is wasted effort. The only one things are, are below. Now, why is this is important? Because f of x can be expensive to evaluate. So you want to be uh, sure that you evaluate as few uh, times as possible. So you want to have a very good proposal uh, distribution. Now, uh, you can see basically now what is the probability of that you accept things. So you can just write uh, the probability of, uh, let's see, u. u is going to be an uniform uh, 0, 1 such that you accept, so basically this is going to be less or equal than f of y divided by m g y, in which uh, y basically follows uh, g uh, of y, right? So this is basically tells you roughly uh, how, uh, in what's the probability that you will uh, uh, accept samples, and you want to maximize that. So. I mean, you can rewrite this as usual. So you, this is going to be the expectation on u and y of uh, the uh, indicative uh, function. So u is equal than uh, f of y, g, g, uh, m, g of y, right? I mean, this is a trick that people have used. Uh, I mean, I guess you're very used to that. Then you're going to do, uh, basically, we'll do conditional uh, expectation. Uh, is that clear? So you're going to do this is going to be expectation of u, uh, no, sorry, of y, expectation on u, uh, the same thing, and, uh, and indicative function of u less or equal than f of little y, or well, capital Y, uh, m, y, given y, right? So you fix y, and then you run uh, on this other one. Now, okay, I'm, okay, I'm sorry. This is very, uh, it's not very good um, to handwriting. So you can compute this. This is very easy. This is a uniform, uh, it's a uniform uh, random variable. So you know exactly this, what this is going to be. So this is going to be uh, expectation in y of basically uh, f of y, m, g of y. But is this step too fast or is it okay? So you fix y, and then you compute the, the expectation of u of this function. Okay, let's do it uh, so, slower. So this is going to be expectation on y. This is nothing more the probability of u less than f uh, y m g of y, and you can think uh, given uh, y is equal to, for example, little y, and this is just little y. And this is just between zero and one, so this is just basically that, that quantity. And this is what you have here. Now, you have this, uh, and you can just go ahead, integrate this guy, so this is nothing more the integral, on, uh, let's say, y of f of little y divided by m g of little y times the, uh, the PDF of y, 
in PDF of y, we suppose that it's just a little g of y, g of y dy. These two cancel. Let's assume that f is actually integrated to one. So basically, you have one over m. So the acceptance uh, uh, ratio that is basically this is nothing more than one over m. So now, what is this important? Uh, because you recall that m has to be such a way that m of gx has to be greater or equal than f of x. Now, what happens if, if these guys are far apart? So the easier way to think about that is, for example, you have two Gaussians that are kind of far apart. So you can think you have g is here, or let's suppose g here. And then you have some overlap with uh, f x here, right? Now, m has to satisfy this condition. What's going to happen is that you have to make this very, very large. I mean, you will say, like, this is very small here, or less here. So you have to basically have I mean, something that will look like, like that, right? Because this m times g of x has to be always greater than f of x. So that means that m is going to be very, very large. So 1 over m is going to be very small. And therefore, you're going to lose a lot of samples. So basically, most of your sample that is going to be blank is going to fall here. And, and not that many are going to uh, fail, like fall there. So in this case, we need g that is kind of close to f in some certain sense. OK, is that clear? Now, uh, so how is this going to happen? How we want to do this is to go back a little bit to physics and try to use what is called uh, Langevin dynamics. So if one of the versions, there are many versions, well, this is the one that is called overdamp, is basically uh, just this. So dxt is equal to minus an abla of a potential that depends on x, dt plus some annoying term. So there's different ways to think about it. I mean, if you're used to uh, SDs, I think that this is clear. If you're not used to SDs, what you can think is uh, go back to the, um, to the flow equation that is just like x dot is equal to minus v of x. So what is this flow equation is going to do? So I mean, this is just you go downhill if you want to have the oh. So imagine that you have, uh, like I will try to do a 3D picture. So this is going to most likely uh, be horrendous. So you have something that looks like a, like a valley. Uh, I don't know. OK, this is pretty bad. Imagine in your, in your head that this looks 3D. So this is v of x. So it's going to happen is, is x, if x follows x dot is equal to minus v of uh, an outlier v of x, this is going to be basically going downhill. So it's going to go, after x is going to go in this direction. Now, you don't want that uh, in general because you go to the minimum and you're going to get stuck there. So what you're going to do is you're going to add some noise. <coughs> so basically, you kind of go in there, but you have someone that basically kicks you around while you're, uh, while you're walking downhill. This clear, very simple. So the question, like now, why? What, you may ask, like, why do we want this? Like this doesn't that has nothing to do with what we were before. Uh, the point is, is that you can tweak. Uh, okay, so it's, uh, what this does, you can think about it, is this is going to transform your uh, your uh, your distribution. So you can start you can start x naught, like capital x naught, to follow anything. So you can start x naught following, uh, let's call it p, probability p uh, x comma 0. And then when you evolve this thing uh, in time, so t greater than 1, this is going to uh, follow a different distribution. And now what we want to see is, like, can we have this new distribution uh, such that uh, can you, this distribution is a proposal, like, like this g, that approximate this f. So again, the issue with this is that the g can be very far from our uh, f. So they decide, can we generate, or can we somehow get a, a, a g, a proposal distribution, that is closer to f? And I will reckon, I mean, what you will see, is that following, uh, by manipulating this Langevin dynamics, you can get a new f, a new g, that actually is going to be very close to f. 
So in that case, you will, uh, you will lose many, you will lose as few samples as you want. And you will see that in the uh, computer lab later today. So okay, so basically this SD, you start with a certain distribution, and then uh, as you go further in time, you will start to modify it. Now the good thing is, uh, is that there is a way to compute this piece as uh, fairly efficiently, and what you want is basically is there a stationary P. So basically, do we pro we do converge to a stationary sp uh, state in which then we can manipulate to basically be close to our uh, F or our G and then our F. The question is yes. So, so compute P infinity. So the question is, okay, the answer is yes to that. And, and, uh, and the main tool to do this is what's called the feynman cac uh, formula. So I will not go into details what it is, but what I can tell you is like you can pr uh, convert, not this, the other one, sorry. You can convert this SDE to a PDE for P. So you can get what's called the Fokker Planck equation. That reads basically partial T of P. Oh, do I have space? I don't think that I have. Well, let's see if I have X comma T. It's going to be partial X, and this is all A within 1D. Uh, uh, of V of X, P X comma T, um, plus a P of X. So this uh, gives you basically what's the evolution of P. You follow this, uh, uh, this equation. Now, but we want, to, we want well, that, we want to be sure, can we compute a P of X, because of P infinity? So can we have a, like a stationary uh, uh, distribution? So stationary means basically uh, partial derivative of T is equal to zero. So you will say, well, let's make this equal to zero. And let's try to find a solution for this P infinity. So that is fairly standard. So you can find, basically, uh, you will have partial x, uh, v, x, uh, p infinity of x plus uh, p infinity of x. Everything here, partial x equal to zero, right? So this means, basically, this guy here, let's call it a g of x is equal to constant, right? But the problem is like if, what is the constant? So if this guy is very large, uh, this has to integrate for one, so basically if your uh, x is very large, this has to go to zero, so that means basically uh, g of x has to be equal to zero. So what you have at the end is partial x, v of x to infinity of x plus partial x to infinity of x is equal to zero. Still clear? Yes? I don't know, like uh, some point, you, I, I think that you saw this. I mean, French education, I'm sure you did, you saw this. No, yes, no, okay. I will suppose that is, is good. Uh, so, well, let me see, do I have the answer later or I have to, no, I don't have it. Uh, so, uh, you can solve this very easily and this is uh, what is called the Gibbs uh, distribution. So, P infinity is going to be a constant, E minus uh, V of X. Uh, V of x. This is going to be your, uh, your, your solution under suitable conditions for V. Basically, it has to go to infinity at infinity, and so on. And the constant here is fairly straightforward. So why? This constant is basically comes from the fact that the integral in R, or whatever you think is, of, of uh, P infinity of x, dx, has to be equal to 1. So therefore, this constant here is going to be uh, the integral of this thing, uh, sorry, of E minus Vx, Vx. Okay. Now, uh, most likely right now you, you're asking yourself, so what? So what would we do with this? Like, well, this is a few remarks, this is, is, uh, which is pretty important. Now, if you see this terminal uh, probability only depends on V, right? Uh, and V was uh, this kind of weird potential that would try to push 
our uh, push our directory towards the local minimum. But then, okay, but we don't want p infinity, we don't want v, what we want is basically uh, this f, or even more we want p of x. Recall p of x is something that we want to really uh, compute a sample from. So what you could do in this case is basically modify, uh, okay, should I, at least, uh, let's see, how, uh, let's do it here. So the goal is still is, is to sample from p of x, the original one. So you want to do, is basically show or modify v such that at some time, uh, as you increase uh, t goes to infinity, you sample from p and not from p infinity. So basically what you want to do is, if you want to do very crudely, p of x, you want to be equal to your objective one, p, o, p of x, and this is equals to c e minus v of x. So I mean, uh, you can just do uh, basically p of x is going to be proportional of the log of uh, minus the log of v, sorry, uh, the, the error. So you can build v of x, you can uh, build v of x to be equal to minus log of v of x up to some constant that we don't care about because only we want something that is uh, proportional to. So great, now uh, we have, let me see if we have, so now we have a new uh, P, uh, SDE. So DXT equals to NABLA, well this is an X, a log of P of X plus square root of two DWT. This is a, a, a Wiener uh, process, so just like a Brownian motion. And so what we know about this is, is that if we run this guy for long enough, the uh, distribution of this x, so recall this one here, will converge to distribution of, of p, the one they're looking for. So in this case, we can have like a proposal uh, uh, distribution that is much closer to what we want. Therefore, we can accept more and more often. And you will see this in the, in the computer lab. Okay, questions? No, yes, no. Okay, so what do you, how do you do this uh, in practice? Is uh, it's going to be exactly the same, so you will start, you will resolve this thing. A uh, question? Sorry. So what you're going to do in this case, you will start with x naught, right? You will sample this from something simple, let's say like a Gaussian, 0, 1, and then you will evolve it. Recall like this terminal, uh, terminal uh, this p infinity, it doesn't matter what do you start with. It only matters that after a certain time, you will start becoming closer and closer to p. And that's actually what we want. So you start for something, whatever you want, and then you will run this machinery. So this is uh, what is called the euler maruyama discretization. So you will say xn plus one is equal to xn um, plus the log likelihood, the, or this, well, this is normally called the score function of p of xn uh, plus, I don't recall exactly how this is, no, dt, uh, this is a dt here. Uh, plus two, square root of two, uh, and this is just um, a Gaussian random variables. So what you will find is, as, again, as you go n is grows to infinity, uh, the samples uh, that this uh, generate are going to be very, very close to p. And now what you can do basically the, um, the radiation sample uh, that you did before. So you take these guys and, uh, I mean, it's exactly the same as, as you can see, is the, the, the equations are a little bit different, and this is actually will give you a very good approximation of your, uh, of your final, uh, of your target distribution. So that's roughly, oh wait, let me see, is there anything else here or? Okay. So all of this is classical. So again, what you do is first, I mean, everything hinges on the fact that you start from something that is used to sample, and that you transform either by computer and inverse, either by uh, reaction sampling, or either by solving, uh, solving an, uh, an ODE, and then have a reaction sample set at the end. So everything hinges in the same principle. Now, what is are the cons of this? So the main difficulty is that we need to know P, or we need to know something that is proportional to P. Uh, however, 
uh, in many, many cases, we don't have access to P. We only have access to samples of that. So basically, you have samples. You want to recover P somehow. And then you can do it more and more samples. And, and that's basically what we're talking uh, next. So OK, let's pause here for uh, a little bit. Do you have any questions? OK, what is not clear? I don't know. I mean, uh, yes, no questions? Left and right? No? OK, there. So here you choose uh, uh, to look for a stationary solution of the Fouquet-Planck equation. Yep. Uh, because um, uh, for a target distribution P, you can easily just choose V uh, uh, to be a minus the logarithm in order to get uh, exactly. uh, the, the correct distribution. What if um, instead of looking for a stationary solution, you fix some horizon, time horizon mm -hmm. capital T, and then you solve numerically that Fouquet-Planck equation for a given V, you will have a distribution, and then you look for v through uh, some parameterization to to match the distribution. So yeah, that's a very good question. So yes, you could do uh, exactly that, right? You can do uh, you can fix a time horizon t, and and you can basically modify a v to give you exactly what you want, and that's basically what we we'll do next. Um, but in this case, I mean, pe what people will normally do it is just uh, run it for a long time. Uh, why? Is because uh, once you're fairly far uh, in T, you will continue generating things that are really close by. So if you have to go back, you, you have a horizon, you go to the horizon, you generate something, then you have to come back from zero, generate something, you go back to zero, generate something. In this case, the advantage of this is like, as if your like, N is large, you can continue running these things and then uh, generate more samples without having to go back to zero. Questions? Yes, no? I mean, if you have questions, uh, you're too shy to answer, that, well, to ask, that's fine. You will most likely have questions in the, t in the uh, computer lab. It's going to be uh, implementing this a little bit, and hopefully either you can answer your question yourself or you will be less shy and you will ask them. So let's go to the next part. So, uh, wait. so everything that I've told you so far is, is, is classical, very classical uh, um, sampling techniques has been, I have like 30 years at minimum. Now, the problem here is uh, what do we do when do we do not have access to P? Who we can generate this, uh, these samples or how we can approximate these things? So this is where diffusion models uh, are coming to the, into the game. So the main idea here is you, you want to sample from this solution P by basically adding noise and then denoise uh, your samples. So this is kind of a little bit weird, but uh, hopefully it's going to be clearer uh, later. So the main idea here is basically you have this dog picture in the bottom, and you have this, this picture, and then you will start it to corrupt it. You will start to add noise to it. And you will add so much noise, ah, thank you. You will add so much noise, that at the end it's just like a basically, it, it's not different than just completely random uh, noise. And then what you want to do is basically try to go the other way back. So try from that noise to go back and generate a picture of this uh, dog again. And as you can see, the equations are, look very similar to what we saw before. Uh, the difference is that, again, you don't know P. You just have to find a, a, a way to approximate this P of X. You only have access to samples. Uh, and then, I mean, this has been a fairly uh, successful uh, lately. And why do we want this for, uh, for uh, scientific computing? is because you can really go to basically corner case, cases that are not really present on the, on the training set. For example, you have this picture of like a, a, a panda with a chef hat and uh, I don't know, like a hulu, I don't know how you call that in, uh, in English. Uh, this definitely was not on the training set. Uh, so you can even generate these things that are really, really on the extreme that are fairly reasonable and that look pretty realistic. We have the corgi with uh, like a sushi, Sushi House, which I'm pretty sure that was not on the training set. So what we want is to leverage this to generate these uh, fairly things very uh, the extreme of the distributions. So let's go a little bit uh, through this. So uh, I, I want to have this lecture a little bit to, to introduce you uh, a little bit to this diffusion model. So later when you read the paper, 
uh, it's going to be a little bit easier to read it. So uh, at least you understand where this is coming from. <coughs> so there are three ways to define uh, these, uh, these models. So you have the SDE perspective that's going to be, as you see before, just a, uh, a very, a very typical, uh, uh, typical like uh, uh, Stochastic process. You can have the PDE that basically goes through a uh, Feynman CAC formula, and then you have the ODE that is, I mean, if you're a computer scientist, you will call the probability flow. If you are a mathematician, normally you will do like a method of characteristics type of uh, approach. Uh, so today, we will use uh, the two up, so SDE and ODE, to hopefully give you an idea of how, how, to, how this can be done. PDE is going to be very similar to what we had before, so you have the feynman cat formula, you have the Fokker Planck equation, and then you do a little bit of uh, mathematical uh, acrobatics to do what you want. Okay. Now, the second thing is that there are three main formulations of how you want to learn this distribution. So there are three objectives, so one is you want to uh, learn the score function. So this is exactly what we had before. So you can try to learn this. That's one alternative. Uh, it turns out that it's, uh, it's a little bit hard <laughs> to do properly, so you have to define some like uh, what's called elbow evidence lower bound. Uh, it is a little bit annoying. Then you have the denoiser, that is, is the one that I, I will introduce today. So what is the denoiser? It's basically a neural network that you give it a corrupted image by Gaussian noise and try to give you uh, without noise. Uh, just think about this corgi, you add noise, and basically you want to uh, get the noise out, uh, out of it. And the second one uh, is basically you want to uh, see what is the noise that you need to add to a function to basically, no, the noise that you want to add for an image, uh, so you recover the noise image. It's a bit weird, but you can do uh, it, it. It turns out that these three uh, things are equivalent, at least asymptotically equivalent. So it doesn't matter which one you choose, you should arrive to the same type of formulation. Uh, today, for the sake, uh, this, the, the sake of uh, simplicity, we will work with the denoiser one. And you will see how the denoiser kind of like uh, makes a link with the score functions. And if you, just like a reminder, a score function is exactly what we've seen before, right? I mean, exactly this term that we have here. And if you want to learn more, uh, there's like this a very good, uh, paper by, I think it's Calvin Luo, uh, that is, I mean, has like a computation in every sense. You can go there and it really start from the first principle and, and do all the computations necessary to, uh, to, to, to show that these things are uh, equivalent. Okay, and now it's going to be mostly Blackboard. So do you have any questions so far? I have a question there. So I can read. So, uh, so for people in at home or whatever you are, uh, uh, the question is like, what is the X sigma? So the X sigma is a uh, is uh, what's called a denoiser. So you give it uh, um, an image X, which you suppose that I have a noise of uh, intensity sigma, and then will give you back is basically uh, the denoise image X naught, and you assume that basically uh, satisfy this relationship like uh, X. Uh, it's going to be uh, the noise image x that you have an input. It's going to be the denoise image x naught plus some uh, random noise that uh, has like a, the um, uh, normally you suppose that is normal uh, Gaussian noise with uh, uh, STD uh, sigma. Is this clear? Yes. No. Okay. Now let's go to the uh, the board and let's start with this. Okay. So let me put here. So let's try to go, uh, I have until, uh, I have four, five, okay. I should have, I, should. I mean, we have time. I mean, I'm planning to go very slow or as slow as I can. So if you have questions, just please, uh, uh, just stop me. Okay, uh, I can erase here, right? Can you erase here? Yes, okay. So we are gonna change a little bit the notation. Uh, Mostly, uh, so it's a little bit closer to what people would use in, in CS. So the first thing is that you have the notation, uh, of, I mean, it's very weird notation, but uh, what we use extensively, so this uh, normal uh, is curly N, it has two meanings, so if it has three, uh, three inputs, this is basically the, 
the Gaussian uh, function, the, uh, the, CF, uh, the PDF of the Gaussian. If you only have uh, two, this is basically just, uh, I mean, it's just a Gaussian distribution. The difference here is like, we want to be sure that you understand which is the, the parameter, basically mu, and which is uh, x, the, the variable. Because we're gonna kind of take the derivatives and gonna do a few acrobatics in that. Okay, so let's start with this. So let me just be sure that it's the correct thing. So we'll start with a very simple SD. So it's a little similar what we saw before, but uh, Yeah. So most uh, papers start with this SD and then they, they basically the mo the, uh, they play some acrobatics in the F and G to make it something simpler. So the first simplification is that we suppose that this F has a very simple uh, structure, so it's going to be just a drift uh, times F that depends on T, DT plus. So just a very simple uh, modification. Now, uh, at the same time, uh, when you have these type of things, you kind of start with a certain distribution, and then uh, you start, you basically, you, as you evolve, you start to change your distribution. So in this case, uh, and this is kind of the main difference of this, you will suppose that you will start that x0 follows distribution of the data. So this will be basically our P that we've seen before. We add a data there to be sure that we don't make a, 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 there's a no, no confusion. And now what is important of this thing is that you can compute what is called uh, the uh, perturbation kernel. So so what is the perturbation kernel? Uh, you can. Let's see how far I can go uh, there, I guess. Okay, a little bit there. The perturbation is very sim is, is simple. So it has a very, again, uh, non-standard notation. So zero t. And this is basically tells the what is the distribution of x comma t if you were to start with just a Gaussian with a direct delta at uh, x is equal to minus x zero. So this was tell, tells us basically, suppose that you start with, uh, just don't forget about the P data for now, suppose that the initial distribution is just a direct delta, the center at zero, what is going to be the distribution uh, along the way, like a uh, time t? Uh, and this is nothing more than, as you may, let me see if this is correct. So using that notation there, going to be x of t, uh, s of t x naught, and this is s square of t, sigma square of t identity. So this is basically tells you how this, uh, this evolves. Uh, if you have an SD background, you could, well, uh, PD background, you could see that this is nothing more than the, the heat kernel being applied uh, when you have a direct delta at the beginning. Now, the, the, the values for this S and T, you can compute them uh, analytically. So S of T is equals to uh, exponential, zero T of F psi. Psi, and sigma of t is the square root of, remember, of the integral, uh, integral to g y uh, divided by s of y dy. So in a nutshell, you start with this, then you can easily get uh, the perturbation kernel. So what is important about this perturbation kernel is that then we can compute this p of x comma t, so p of x comma t, which I mean I don't like to have t, so we'll just uh, do a few modifications. So you will see also this distribution. So to take the t down there, and what you can show that this is nothing more than the convolution of uh, p data with x naught with your uh, perturbation kernel. Yes. So just think when you do, uh, when you have the Green's function, what you do to compute things at times t, you just convolve the Green's function wherever your boundary, your initial condition it is. Now, uh, 
Okay, so we can just like go through the computation in this case. So what is going to happen? This is nothing more than the integral of p data of x naught. And this, uh, what is this? Is nothing more than this guy here. So you can have like a constant e to the minus x minus st of x zero square uh, divided by s t square sigma square t, and this is uh, the x naught. Uh, I mean, do you want to have the, the full answer, or you, do you want me to go step by step? OK, let's go step by step. So OK, you have the same p data, x0. Uh, you do a change of variable. So basically, you move one. You, you just modify a little bit this guy. So s goes there. So you can have, uh, basically, you can transform this as uh, s t minus t. Uh, a, uh, n of x divided by s of t comma x zero comma sigma square identity t x zero and at this point this really looks as a as a convolution so you can just rewrite this guy as a as a convolution let me. So we will have this is going to be equals to, uh, let's see, so let's take the constant out. So s of t minus d here. Uh, and then this is just a convolution between p data and this guy here. So it's going to be p data convolved with, uh, let's see, uh, n uh, 0 comma sigma square of delta t identity. And this has to be evaluated in this guy here. So it's going to be x divided by s of t. So this basically tells you how you're corrupting your data. If you recall in the picture that we saw you uh, in a minute, it's here, you could see that you start for something that is very, uh, wait, uh, it's very, uh, it's very clear, this talk, and then you start to add more and more and more noise to that. So what you want to see in this case is that uh, what is the distribution of the noise at the end of the day? And distribution of the noise is basically just exactly this thing in here. So for example, if we make some assumption like s t is equals one, so constant. Uh, so what is this? It's just it's nothing more. And have your data distribution and then convolve with a Gaussian in which you can have a very large uh, sigma. So if you have a, a very large sigma, this is looks roughly as a Gaussian, right? So you have a, a heat kernel, you add, uh, you basically you add uh, noise to it. At the end of the day, basically you have something that is fairly flat. So what this is doing basically, as P, as T increases, sigma increases, this becomes indistinguishable. of a Gaussian. Now, what do we want this? Because, uh, okay, questions. Is this clear? So you start for something that, uh, for so far, we assume that we know, and we just add noise. At some point, it's so noise that it just looks like noise. I mean, that is basically the main, uh, the, the main uh, uh, point here. Now, why do we want this, then? Is that, sorry. Uh, so what do we want in this case is we want to massage a little bit. Because if you see Gaussian, Gaussian we can do very easily. Right? We can sample from Gaussian. And then the point is like, can we somehow go backwards? Right? You start from something that you know like you, uh, from data. You have something that is Gaussian uh, that is easy to sample. Can we do, go the other way around? Can we sample something that is Gaussian and go back in time and trying to basically uh, sample from P data? So this is exactly what we're trying to do. Now, the choices of S and T is a little bit arbitrary. So for us, uh, we're going to do S of T is going to be 1, and sigma of T is going to be square root of T. 
Uh, this choice uh, in the literature is called the variance uh, exploding. Variance exploding. And we will see how actually this would work. So now, uh, the question becomes, is like, is there any way that we can have something that is not that nasty as uh, this uh, SD? So uh, the answer is yes, we can do what is called the uh, probability flow. So I'm not going to the details, but I basically just want to show you what the formula is, and hopefully that is, it becomes more, uh, uh, it becomes easier to understand why this can be uh, reversed. Because in this case, as you can see, uh, F is, I mean, we don't know what is F, we don't know what is G, we can make assumptions, but then it's like, how actually we come back? And if I show you the probability flow, or the OD, uh, you will see that is, there's a one way to go back and, some, and you will compute something that we've already seen. So let me just go ahead and show you the probability flow of this. Anyway, it's clear so far, I mean, at least so far. We have P data, what we show is like if we follow this ODE, so the SDE, you start to corrupt more and more the, the your initial uh, data, and then basically we arrive to something that looks like Gaussian. Now, you can do this, instead of doing the SD, you can do an ODE, and uh, let me introduce a little bit of notation. Uh, so, we call PX. Can I ask you a question? Sure. Uh, what was the motivation behind this variance exploding on such that you took? Could you explain that a little bit? Uh, there's two things. One is simpler, because S disappears, so uh, it makes the things a little bit simpler. And the second one is that uh, uh, you want normally to solve this between zero and one, as uh, someone in the audience already mentioned. And the point is like you want, you want to have enough noise at the end mm -hmm. so you can have a high variability to going back. So if, if the, what I even told you before is like when you have these Langevin dynamics, it really depends how much noise do you inject. Uh, for example, what we have there is basically the noise is fixed. So uh, if you go back a little bit, uh, the intensity of the, of the noise, uh, a little bit more, the intensity of the noise in this case is just always a square root of two, so it's fixed. So for example, if you have uh, a P that is very localized in one part and very like uh, flat in the other side, it's going to be hard to jump from one to the other. So what you want to do is basically change the noise uh, so you can basically uh, approximate or sample all the space. So that's why this is, uh, the choice is important to basically add enough noise so when you sample, you sample from ver something very, very large and you then slowly uh, basically uh, drift something that you know. By the way, on this slide you have a clean this thing in a second. Oh, oh yeah. yeah, yeah. That's correct, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. sorry, 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 yeah. Okay, <laughs> uh, did I answer your question? Okay, perfect. So, uh, so okay, let me introduce a little bit of notation. Uh, again, this is mostly to make hopefully f follow this a little bit simpler. So this P X comma uh, sigma, uh, this is going to be nothing more than P data convolved with uh, a Gaussian uh, zero comma a, uh, sigma square of T of entity. And then P of T of X, uh, we will just have basically as T minus d uh, p reduce this guy here, x divided by s t comma sigma square, uh, comma sigma, sorry, of t. So this is mostly for uh, notation, uh, to reduce the notation burden. So now, uh, I just want to show you the equation. I'm not going to do the derivation because I, we should, uh, no, we don't have enough time. So I just let me show you what is this. So another way to solve this ODE, so this SDE, is to solve it as an SD, as an ODE. So this is X dot, and you will, solve, you will see a, a, a friend here that you've already seen. So this is going to be the score function of log of P X comma sigma of T, right? So, I mean, again, the derivation is a little bit annoying, so I'm not going through, through, to go through that. But basically, you can write this SD for a, this SD for a given choice of uh, F and G. You can write it in this form. And as you can see, 
Uh, this is what we've already been trying to compute, right? So uh, if you know the physics score function, then you can basically run this ODE. Now what is important of this o o ODE is that now it's very simple to see that this is reversible, right? So you can go from zero to one, and you can go backwards. Uh, this is just an autonomous system, depends on T. As long as these guys are well behaved, everything here should be reversible unless you, I mean, you blow up. But uh, the assumption that you don't blow up, you can go back and forth uh, very easily. Uh, so what I mean with this is basically you can uh, sample X capital T, something that looks like a, a Gaussian, uh, like a, something like a Gaussian, then you can run from T, I mean, this is like basically going down to X of zero, and this guy is going to follow P data of X. So this is, again, this is another way of doing, I mean, this is a little bit complicated, but this is exactly the same as before. Um, so you sample for something that you know how to sample, in this case, it's like a Gaussian, and then you solve this ODE in reverse, and you will have something that actually follows the, uh, uh, the distribution that you want. Now, uh, question to the audience. Why cannot we do use this directly? So what are we missing? How if you were to use this, what do we need that we don't know yet? So do we know P data? No, right? I mean, this is what basically we want to know. So there is like how we know, how we compute this uh, a score, a score function. And this is kind of the stroke of genius uh, that people have in, uh, uh, in individual models is how do we compute this thing here? Now, the, the answer is a little bit weird, but it comes from what's called the 2D formula. So let me just, uh, let me change the color here. So we'll have to this, wait, how do you write this, this guy's name? Uh, yes. So, uh, so what that is say is, is, is fairly simple. So basically what it tells you is uh, the setup is as follows. So you have a, 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 let's say a variable x, uh, let's call it t, uh, just x, and we will say that this is equal to our other random variable, x naught, plus some noise that we suppose that is Gaussian, right? So in this case, uh, you have a random variable uh, here, you have a random variable here, and you have a random, a random variable here. So what is the advantage of this? Is that if we condition with respect to, for example, uh, this uh, x naught, x naught, we know exactly what x is gonna look like because this is just a, a Gaussian, right? So if we have the probability of, uh, let's say, uh, x uh, given x naught, this is going to be just a Gaussian, uh, zero, and let's suppose like you have a sigma square, right? So you, don't, you know exactly that. So it turns out that if you have uh, this particular uh, setup, then, you have the, so for, so the following formula, so you have the expectation of x0 given x is going to be equals to uh, uh, x, well, let me just remember this exactly what it is. So yes, so it's going to be x uh, plus, uh, well actually this is a more general, you can do like sigma here, uh, just, well, just, yeah, well, sigma, and then you will have exactly your, uh, what you want. So recall that X here has this own uh, marginal, right? So what you will see is that if you compute the expectation of X not given X, this is going to be equals to X plus, well, some uh, a, uh, a, the covariance matrix times the score function with respect to X itself. So as you can see, this is basically what we want, so we can just modify this a little bit to, to set up in our, uh, to, to fit our framework. So this is, we just have to add a few indices here and there, and it's, it will be the same. 
So what is this true? Is because we have this perturbation kernel, right? You see, if you fix x, xt is going to follow a, a, a Gaussian distribution. So therefore, it fits this exactly this case. So what you have in this case is basically the expectation of x0 given xt. This is going to be xt plus, uh, I mean, recall that we, uh, we suppose that s is equals to 1. So this basically is 1. This is 1. So you will have uh, s square t times log of p. And going back to the notation that we have there, x sigma. Now, you can see this is exactly what we're looking for. So the one here with the one here. So now, if we're able to compute uh, that guy in there, we can have this. If you have this, we can do reverse time integration. You can sample from your distribution. Is the steps clear? No, yes. So this is basically uh, working on what do we want? What do we need? No, the question is like, what the heck is this? So, is there, yes, there's a question there, I think, yes. For the conditional expectation, you could do uh, something like train a neural network to project uh, orthogonally x0 on x? Uh, it's a little bit different, but yes, it's, that's very close. So, uh, so you can think about this, right? You're going back to this. What is this? So basically, you have a, a distribution, and you corrupt it with noise, right? Now, what you want to do is like you have a, a noisy samples, and what you want to do is basically tell me uh, what would be your original uh, image. So basically, imagine that you have a Gaussian, you have mu, and then you have uh, you co corrupt mu with noise, and then basically from noisy samples you want to recover where is mu. So this expectation here is nothing more than a denoiser. So you give it a sample that you know exactly how much noise it has. Can you come back and tell me what the original image was? So this is nothing more than the denoiser that we saw before. D x T comma sigma T. Now, this interpretation is a little bit weird uh, in the sense that uh, it seems like uh, someone like uh, took a hat and like uh, pulled a rabbit out of a hat, or like a cow in this case. But actually, we'll show you a small computation that this is actually uh, is true. So, uh, just let's wait a little bit of questions. No. So okay, uh, let's do uh, let's do a recap of how this is, is going. So first. We have the SD. We show that you can basically SD when you go uh, back uh, forward in time. You basically you're corrupting your, your information. You're corrupting your data. Then I uh, forced an, uh, an, uh, an uh, equivalent ODE uh, formulation in which you do the same, but you have an explicit uh, correspondence of the score function. The, and then what I claim is that you can start for something that is Gaussian, and you can go back in time and a sample from your uh, data. The only thing that is missing is how we compute this uh, score function here. What I claim afterwards is that we can uh, leverage this 2 this formula to link the, uh, our log function to what's called a denoiser. And denoiser in particular is much easier to, uh, to, to train because what we're doing is basically you, you just give a network some noise and then ask him to recover the image. So you can train the denoiser. So or you can observe the train, uh, train a denoiser by doing the follow. So uh, let's call like a loss function on d comma sigma. And this is going to be, you suppose that your expectation like y follows a certain data distribution. You suppose that uh, n follows like a, a, a normal 0 comma sigma. And then what you do is basically you take a denoiser, you feed it uh, some data, you corrupt the data with noise, 
and then you ask him to uh, denoise this corrupted, uh, corrupted noise at that noise by basically forcing that you have to recover the data that you fit in, right? I mean, if you were to do like a denoiser in the mature learning fashion, it's basically, I know what you want to recover, I just noise, uh, give you a noise version, and I told you this is what I want. And, and this is exactly, uh, is, I mean, this is basically how you will train it uh, by yourself. So again, this is uh, very simple, and you could see that this doesn't do, use anything of there. So you don't have to go any SDs or any, anything complicated. The only thing that you need to do, create a network such that you give something noise, you give it like a certain uh, noise level, and it can recover you the, uh, the original uh, image that you fed. Questions? Oh, yes. Uh, so how much time do we have? Five minutes, 10 minutes? Uh, should I stop me there? I mean, I have another computation to do, but it's gonna be pretty long. And I think that if we, if we do the computation and then have uh, half time, and then I would come from lunch, people will have forgotten about that. So yeah, I feel like yeah, people are tired and hungry. So let's stop here and uh, we'll continue after lunch.